Actually, we are facing it right now. Dagmar is present here. Also, we participated in this project, and uh, it was a whole gap in Polish historiography, the province and the occupation uh, in Polish province. And I was really puzzled when I simply went to the archives and I looked through all those dozens, hundreds of testimonies, because I really, it wasn't, uh, when I moved there, I really asked people and nobody was speaking about it. Nobody would talk about it. And I thought, okay, so maybe they were simply taken to Belzec, like, mm -hmm. um, but when I discovered that there were over a thousand people, that it was really like Jan Tomasz Gross stated, the central point of occupation. So the question is why it wasn't talked about. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't talk about facing with, um, common memory before. Right now we are doing it uh, because we simply started to describe it and um, people in province maybe they don't face, they didn't face it, right now they face it with a whole campaign against the Holocaust researchers in Poland. Because uh, the, those who witnessed, who observed, uh, are not present anymore. And uh, so the whole campaign in entered and want to fill, when, when we filled this gap with the, the, our discoveries, the problem started because we, we simply showed all the authors of this Dalaist Notes book that it was really tangible, it was something that, that everyone knew what, what happened to the Jewish people. And another question is also this uh, indifference. There was no indifference. And this is what we also have to face. But the process starts right now. I, I, I don't think everyone, anyone tried to do it earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, publicly, I think that no one asked uh, those Polish witnesses about what they saw. They were, they were asked by persecutors. Uh, I also tried to guess what was, uh, what was, uh, you know, there was this investigation, but as I told you, in, uh, in uh, monographies of localities, there are hardly one or two sentences about Jewish inhabitants of those villages and towns, and usually the occupation is uh, summed up with, uh, the occupational fate uh, is summed up with one sentence, so this is a taboo. And uh, right now we are doing our best to discover uh, this reality, but it's not easy. Yourself, My experience with yeah. oral testimonies yeah. is something that you can hear in voice. Uh -huh. When they talk about their, the things that they saw, like, I don't know, saying goodbye to the neighbors, yeah. or uh, the executions that they saw, they have a different voice, and uh -huh. then they start on this lever, general lever that Jews owned all the buildings, shops, etc. You can feel the difference in their voice. So this is really something that covers the real experience. But I, pers I participated in a field work on uh, Sandomierz territory where we um, worked on blood label myth. It was um, 10 years, no, uh, 14 years ago. And I was really astonished what I heard, what people told to us without any, any problems about killings, about partisans who contributed to those killings, etc., about collaboration. But later on, when they entered onto this level of Jews that rule the world, it was really, they didn't have any problem with this conspiracy theory. Yeah, with this switch. So this is, I think, that those two levers that when they meet, I don't know if they are, they can meet, uh, but uh, the problem is when, when we start on this general level without digging into the past. This it only shows how taboo the topic is, Jewish belongings, but actually in primary sources of uh, local administration documentation, there's a, there are files of letters of requests concerning the Jewish apartments, um, Jewish um, I don't know, furnitures and etc. But uh, I think that maybe simply persecutor who did very good investigation 
uh, Maria Gacek, but she focused on Gestapo crimes. And this is also that I have to underline. She didn't, for sure she didn't ask her questions, and for sure she didn't take notes of all the things she heard, because she focused on German um, activity. And, and maybe also this is the reason for which we know that little from the testimonies about the third stage of the Holocaust, where we don't have any names, so also we don't know almost anything about belongings. And using the voice, my, my voice I'd like to add to, to this image of Korczak, uh, my experience, I'm a mother of 12-year-old boy, uh, and in his book uh, on history, um, it was, I don't know, published a year ago, we can read that Korczak was a pediatrician, was a great writer, and we can not read that he was a Jew. Which is true, unfortunately, in many sources, like educational sources, it's not written almost n nowhere that he was called Henry Goldschmidt and he was born in a like, purely Jewish family, assimilated or Polonized, so to say, because he was speaking Polish, not Yiddish, neither Hebrew. But oh, actually, he learned 200 words in Hebrew. It was not enough to speak fluently. But coming back to the, to the gender issues, there is hope. There's always hope. Uh, recently, last year in Poland, there was a book was published uh, about the Jewish caregivers, not necessarily those who were employed by the institutions of social care, but also about the pediatricians, uh, like doctors, and it, it seems that this this interest in, in into women histories not his stories, but her stories. Her yes, her stories is growing and hopefully that's going to be developed. And I promised you to tell you the story of Sara Grobarianowska, so maybe that's the moment. She was, the, she was not the director, she was not the vice director, she was just a regular um, caretaker in one of the orphanages in Jelna 67. And when the deportation started, she announced a gathering of all of the workers and she wanted them to promise, she just wanted them to promise that they will stay with their children till the last moment. So, I mean, not, not only she decided, but she wanted other people to decide to, 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 to stay at Fina till the last moment. Catherine, you want to address the point that Wolf made or no? Sure, so I guess yeah. this is a question for all of us, perhaps. Oh, the microphone, the microphone. Oh. So a question for all of us, perhaps, I mean, as scholars, is it not our responsibility to push back when, when there are popular narratives that are at odds with the historical record? I mean, is that even an option? Like, isn't that our job? I mean, so, what do you think? <laughs> no, no, I didn't want to discourage you. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying you, know, you need a long kind of uh, trajectory there, sure. and uh, this uh, doesn't go well with the public, and it oh. takes a long time, and... I'm well, seeing that firsthand. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> mm, no, all of them, all of those who survived, escaped after killings or in post-war um, period. Um, I described it in, in a few articles. Uh, there were 34 people killed in this region after the war, and this is also the mythology, um, myth of uh, anti-communist partisans that I am fighting with because they were killed by those. Um, heroes of nowadays that we build them monuments and no so there there was no Jewish life they they, they left on February 1946 all of them and uh, there are I don't know any there are some descendants of people who converted and all of them uh, the majority of those who converted were killed the mothers their children and grandchildren survived but uh, they are asking me right now for help to establish their, the fate of their relatives, but they, they are in the underground, so this is the only reality that I know. Yes, yeah. So, so the Israelis, have, so part of this narrative is not just defiance in that what the prisoners quote unquote felt, it's also the story that uh, the conductor of Raphael Schechter went in front of the Council of Elders and they refused to let him perform it because it was too dangerous, but he supposedly stood up to them and so in defiance of the Council of Elders and also of the Nazis it was performed. Again, this story has changed over time 
Edgar Caza is the only one who tells this story. And the survivors who settled in Israel, there's an article that just came out by Tzvi Zemel in which he interviewed some of them, and they are vehemently saying, no, 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 you've, you've got this wrong. This novella has been misunderstood. It's fiction. This is not the way it was. So, But I think, too, this ties in to sort of these, I wish Shirley Gilbert was here, these consoling stories and the role music plays, just kind of like the story you were telling, and sort of these redemptive, uplifting stories. Music often plays a part there, and I think it just has to do with sort of the Western romanticized notion of music itself. No, I would never say that. I would never say that there is a silence. Silence in general. I know that there are diaries, uh, at least three or parts, which um, survived the past. Let's say it like this. But um, they are not open to anybody. I know from for one researcher from the United States, he. Uh, received one diary, but uh, he promised the family that he would never tell the name or the contact and so on. I tried to push him, I was not successful. But I think this is, um, I don't know what's written in it. <laughs> yes, okay, but um, I think uh, that there are diaries, maybe, yeah? I know three, but nothing else. Of course, we can uh, look at the survivor testimonies. There's a large amount, uh, but this is exactly the thing what I try to say, that. Um, they are speaking about one given moment in time and not about the changes and the shifting personality and so on. So this is why many articles is said, it is said, for example, I worked on one person, Heinrich Demerer, that he was the hero of the camp, he saved many lives and um, there's the other um, side of the medal. Um, he was a traitor. He, uh, sent um, two camp physicians to their deaths and so on. So either this or that, nothing in between and it, it's never mentioned when this appeared and if it's the truth and so on. So I mean there are testimonies but it's, uh, of course it's always complicated mm -hmm. but we have to deal with this. Okay. Yes? So thank you. There's never enough time but of course there's more opportunities to talk among ourselves at lunch. Thank you.